So what we're going to talk about next is the Doppler effect. It's the last little piece of our light toolkit that we'll develop and carry with us throughout the rest of the course and into the next course if you take it. Again, I said this before, astronomers often take pictures and they're pretty and we can tell a little bit about things like the structure, morphology of galaxies, but most of the information we get out spectroscopically. And we've already learned a number of different things. If it's a thermal spectrum, we can measure its temperature. Um, by measuring the peak, also the integrated light, we can get the temperature through Stefan's law. Um, atomic transitions, we learn that depending upon what lines are there, we learn about composition, we also learn about temperature. So this is another tool that can tell us about what's going on physically that we observe in spectra in all sorts of different ways. The simplest way is just the straight uh, Doppler shift along the line of sight, Doppler effect. You're all familiar with this in terms of sound waves. We'll do light waves in just a second, but sound waves, have you ever been standing on the street in a police car or an ambulance is going by or maybe a train is going by blowing the whistle and you hear the high pitch and then as soon as it passes you, the pitch drops kind of instantaneously, kind of like a, I hope you got that because I only do that once. <laughs> uh, you've all experienced that before, right? That's the sound waves. Basically, you have something that's emitting at a particular frequency, it's sending out waves, in that case, compressional waves compressing the air at a particular frequency, but since it's moving, the waves get compressed in the direction of motion. We'll work through this example here with light in just a second, but it's the same idea, they get compressed in the direction of motion, so what you receive is a shorter wavelength, which is a higher frequency. With sound, we interpret that as a change in pitch. With light, we, our brain interprets it as a change in color. So let's work through the, a couple of examples here. So here I have something that emits a single frequency. Kind of annoying. Oh, everyone perked up. That's cool. And so this is just a simple demonstration of the Doppler shift. You'll hear it. I'll start with this section here. Maybe I'll shorten this so I don't do anything here. You hear it? High, low, high, low. Now, it might be confusing because you're also hearing reflections off the walls, but do you hear the, the change in pitch moving towards you, away from you? Just like the ambulance example. I'll do it over here next. Okay, you all hear it. See, I don't hear anything, so it's not moving towards or away from me. I hear some stuff bouncing off the walls, but I just get the same frequency, so I'm trusting that the laws of physics are working. And you're actually hearing what I want you to hear. You hear the change in pitch there? But here, I'll do it this way. And you'll see that, except for what you hear bouncing off the walls, you probably don't hear what you heard before. Relatively constant frequency, right? At least for you over there. I've been carrying this around my book bag for days, and every time I put my book bag down, it starts to buzz. Okay. Uh, changes the pitch. With light, changes the uh, color. Even the, the frequencies and the wavelengths, but the color. So here's an example. We've got a source of light sitting out there in space. Let's look at the top panel. We've got observers on either side of it. Uh, we've got two space shuttles there. We've never launched two space shuttles at the same time, but you can just imagine. Observers on either side. And uh, it's stationary with respect to the observer in this example. So it's emitting light at a particular frequency. Let's say once every second. Here we see the crests of the waves. So in the first second it emits it and it starts moving out. In the next second it emits it, let's say it's out here, <coughs> time three, time four. So here we are at time five. These are the crests of the waves that were emitted previously. They're all uniformly spaced, so they'll be received at the same separation that they were emitted. And so you'll see the same color of light as was emitted. But here's the case of a moving emitter of light. So here we are at time one and it emits its light and expands out into this circle by uh, this later time 5. By time 2, when it emits its light, it's no longer at this position, it's moved. So this crest is centered on that point. Crest 3 is centered on this point. Crest 4 on this point. It's centered on a point that has moved because the object's moving. And the end result is in the direction of motion, the crests of these waves get compressed. And opposite the direction of motion, they get spread out. And so here, this is a shorter wavelength, higher frequency, and that corresponds to bluer light 
Over here it's red or light. And we still use the terms blue shift and red shift if it's outside the visible spectrum. It's being shifted to higher frequencies, like UV light being shifted to the x-rays. We still call that a shift towards the blue. So this is a really powerful tool for figuring out motions. We can't see the thing moving towards us or away from us, but we can figure out its motion towards us and away from us by seeing how much the light is shifted. Let me see what I got next. Okay, I'll get that second. I have a little web page here that should demonstrate this. Let me dim the lights and make sure it's easy to see. Okay, so let me uh, run the animation here. So here, you can think of it as a source of lights, a source of sound waves, whatever. Those are the crests coming out of the source. Now I'm going to enable the motion of this thing. You see how they're getting piled up in the in a, okay, direction of motion? And we bounced off the wall, piled up in the direction of motion, stretched out in the opposite way. Now I can't make this thing run slower or faster. If I slow it down, you don't see that much of a difference until I eventually stop it, something around there, and it's pretty symmetric, or I can make it go faster. Now, light travels at the speed of light, and we know from Einstein nothing can go faster than the speed of light. So with light waves, you can never have the scenario that I'm about to pass, but with sound waves, you can, sound travels at a certain speed through air, and you can't actually have an object move faster than the speed of sound supersonic. And we have jets that do this. And so imagine this is not as light waves anymore, because this is about as, right there is, I'm traveling at the sound speed. So if I was traveling right just below the speed of light, you see that the wave fronts pile up. But let's say this is sound, so I can go faster if I want. Your object stays ahead of the wave, because the wave can't travel faster than the speed of sound in the medium. And you see they pile up. They reinforce each other on a conical shape. And so, uh, this would be, in case of sound, a sonic boom. Imagine you're standing underneath. Here, I'll, I'll wait over here. And I see the thing, and then after it passes, boom, I get all those sound waves all compressed. Really, really loud. How many of you have heard a sonic boom before? And I don't know if you paid attention, but you see the thing fly overhead first, and then the sonic boom caught up with you? It's traveling faster than the sound. So that's, that's it's called a shock wave. Now here's a picture of uh, a jet right when it's crossing the sound barrier. I don't know why this is. I, I need to look this up. But right when they cross the sound barrier, you can actually see the cone visually, too. So, pretty cool. So let's see what it would look like spectrally. Here's an emission spectrum. This is the bomber emission spectrum for three different speeds. In the middle, we have at rest. So we have some object at rest emitting the bomber sequence at the emission line wavelengths that's supposed to, 656.3 nanometers for the red. Now, if we have something moving towards us, those waves get compressed, shorter wavelength. And so here's something moving at us at 600 kilometers per second. You get shorter wavelengths, so 656.3 goes down to 655.0. Very small on change. It's such a huge speed, 600 kilometers every second. You now, we don't see stuff like that in our everyday experiences. Very, very fast, but uh, out in space, those kinds of velocities are not uncommon. But it makes just a very minor change. You can see it here on the green and the blue as well. Up top, we have 300 kilometers per second moving away from us. It stretches the waves out, longer waves are moving away. And so you see it at 657.0. And we'll put the math down in a second. But you can flip this process around. You go out, you look at something astronomically, you see emission lines or you see absorption lines, it doesn't matter. You measure the wavelengths, and they're not the wavelengths that you have in the laboratory. They're all shifted one way or the other. You measure the shift, and you can then compute the speed of the object. Very powerful technique. We can actually measure not the whole velocity, but the component of the velocity directly towards us or directly away. It's called radial velocity. Let's bring the lights up a little bit, and we'll go through that math. So Doppler effect is allowing us to measure radial, in other words, line of sight velocities, or speeds. You can use either word. 
And the mathematics for that, pretty simple. What you need to do is, first observation, you measure the change in wavelength, or change in frequency. I'll write it out as change in wavelength. Delta wavelength, and which we see from this diagram here, is quite small. For these rather large speeds, we're just talking about a nanometer or two, or less. And you divide it by the emitted wavelength. Uh, for this red line here, the emitted wavelength is 656.3. We know that because we know the properties of hydrogen. If you have one line, you don't know what's going on, but you might be able to identify the bomber sequence. Say, so, okay, I know the sequence of lines. That's hydrogen at temperature at 10,000 degrees. We have H alpha, bomber alpha. At this particular location, we measure it. It's not where it's supposed to be, so you've got a delta wavelength. Divide by the wavelength emitted, and that shift divided by emitted it's just the speed divided by the wave speed. This equation works for any kind of wave, sound wave, whatever. If you like, the wave speed is C. Another way to do this, I might ask the question in reverse and say something's traveling at you at 300 kilometers per second. Uh, at what wavelength do you observe such and such wave? Suppose I give you lambda emitted, I want to know what lambda observed is. So lambda observed is equal to lambda emitted plus or minus delta lambda. Delta lambda, if you solve for delta lambda. So this can go in two directions. I can give you lambda observed, and you can find the delta and compute the speed. Or I can give you the speed, you can compute the shift in wavelength, and then figure out the observed wavelength. It's the emitted plus or minus the shift plus if it's moving towards you or away from you. Away. If it's moving away, you get the longer wavelengths. So that would be the plus, minus, if it's moving toward you. This would be blue shifted. This would be red shifted. Okay, so that's how that works. And there's an example of that in the homework, and you'll see that on exam. So work through that as sufficiently powerful tool and sufficiently easy to calculate that uh, we'll make use of it.